morning, good afternoon, or good evening whenever you're listening to this podcast. My name is Mitch Corbett. I'm your host of the podcast. Hello, how are you today? And today, uh, after a long, well, I mean, Christmas break, kind of break, uh, uh, we're back with new episodes. Uh, so this episode is uh, one of my oldest friends, uh, Andy Clune, uh from Cruise Ships. Uh, he pretty much kind of taught me a lot of what I know of what to work in video producing, editing, camera work, that sort of thing. And that's why I want to have him on because he has an, an incredible journey where like he learned a lot of the stuff from American schooling, traveled the world, and is now living in uh, New Zealand of all places. And uh, he is, he still does some video work, but he's actually becoming more of a chef. Uh, he's also, uh, I think he's a pro uh, Frisbee golf player as well. And we get into a lot of it. It's a it's a great chat because we just get to catch up and kind of hang out again, uh, like we used to on ships. And uh, I hadn't talked to him forever, but uh, he looks great. He sounds great. He's fantastic. And uh, I, if you're watching this visually, um, don't be scared. I it, during the recording of the podcast, I had hair. Uh, I've since recently I kind of just given myself a nice little buzz because you know it's new year, new me, right? Uh, who knows? I don't know. But <laughs> whatever the case, it may be. Um, you know, just yeah, yeah. Have fun with your life, because you know, as soon as it starts going in the back, I'm talking about my hair, but obviously, you know, as soon as the hair starts going away in the back, I kind of want to just like get rid of it and kind of keep this kind of like chrome dome shape out of mine. Um, but enough about me, <laughs> and uh, let's get to our guest, uh, Mr. Andy. Clifford. You're doing some shows. You're still doing film stuff. Sorry, what was that? Um, how can it go, man? You like you you got like you're still doing video work and stuff. I'm out, I'm kind of out of the video game now. Yeah, I work for a, a community TV station, so they kind of let me do kind of whatever ideas I have. There's some limitations with it, obviously, because community TV, so I can't really do anything like exceptionally like out there or f- like adult orientated. So I have to be careful yeah. with what I do. But like, I don't know. I'm 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 trying to maybe get out of it because it just I, there's no room to grow or anything in that sort of like field so oh I'm really sure. i thought you were i thought you were enjoying it. it seemed like you had like these shows and stuff you got like sets and everything yeah do we ever post cool. the do we ever post our happy memories on facebook no we just post what people, what people want to see it's an illusion Andy. it's an illusion <laughs> what what do you mean <laughs> i mean it's fun like doing the actual work is great but i mean like it's not like uh it's what it's those days where like you're not working you're not filming anything you're not editing anything you're just like yeah sitting at a computer fucking watching stupid videos essentially well i uh i mean that's one thing i try to i guess in terms of like living is to always be enjoying myself and trying to do things that i'm passionate about i mean i've been it's been a struggle over the last few years because i'm like a chef which i'm not i've never you know been a chef i've only i've only done chefing since i got here um so you're like the bradley cooper of uh, new zealand now well i'd love to do film work but you know like i just i there's no i can't get sponsored i can't get sponsored in visas to do film work because new zealanders would love to have those jobs whereas chefs they don't want to be chefs they're like oh no we don't want to be chefs like we'll work in the film industry so i mean there's no point i would never i would never be able to get a sponsorship to do film stuff but so like but you're not you haven't been to school for being a chef or anything so you're taking like the uh no the action Bronson way and like the way the law of chefs go, we're like learning on job and that, that sort of thing. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I ran a food truck for three and a half years and it became like, I could do everything with my eyes closed because it's so small. There's not a lot of components to it, but we were really popular and really like awesome and very simple. Um, and that was how I first learned. And then I moved into like a hotel where we got to make everything from scratch, like breads and muffins and all this stuff and these sauces. And I was like, oh shit, I don't know any of this stuff. And some of the words that they tell you like, oh, we got to sous vide this. And oh, we're going to do, I'm like, what the fuck is that? What does that mean? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I've never been a chef before. So I had to just learn from like scratch. All right. So, well, welcome to the podcast. Hell, how, how are you today? We're already rolling my, my good friend. Oh, my sorry. <laughs> My friend, my friend, the chef slash video producer, uh, Andy Clune, who is all calling all the way from uh, New Zealand, one of my favorite places ever in the goddamn world. Um, so <laughs> you've been on quite the ride since you left uh, ships, my friend. So um, let's take it back a little bit. Uh, so you were uh, you learned video video producing uh, in L.A., correct? Yeah. Yeah. I went to school in uh, Santa Monica. Love and it. so pretty much. But 
and now you're out of that gig. Um, I mean, not that you want to be, but you kind of transitioned. So what's, what's made you want to get into video producing? And then uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> or make you I mean, originally. Right? Well, I mean, originally it's, it's uh, I wanted to be in like animation and stuff. And then we had to take some film classes to learn about animation and how we were going to do animation. And I just realized animation was sitting in front of a computer for hours on end um creating things which is cool but at the same time like I'm much more of an active doer kind of person so when we started making films I was like oh I want to do film um and I was living in Minnesota I grew up in Minnesota so at that time I was kind of like well if I want to do film I should go move to Los Angeles that's like the center of the film business so moved to LA went to school there uh, met a bunch of great friends and had a very like hands-on school it was an art school so it wasn't like UCLA or USC which is you know very prestigious film schools it was kind of more of a a techie private art school that we were just shooting stuff all the time, making little videos around the property. We were just like a bunch of business buildings in Santa Monica down by the beach. Um, do you, feel that, yeah, do you just, feel like that move to, from Minnesota to a completely envir different environment, LA has set you up for uh, more success in terms of like, oh, I'm not, I mean, like you come from a small community and then you went to a large city and then you got to see both worlds. And it's kind of like, did that set you up for success on ships and like with what you're doing now, traveling to New Zealand and Australia and all those uh, places? Yeah. I mean, it kind of opened me up to, I mean, I've always been like a super open person with people. I love meeting new people and moving to LA and I'm coming from Minnesota where everybody's friendly and there's, you know, it's not a lot of violence and stuff. So you just say hi to everybody. And I moved to Inglewood. It was the first place I lived in LA and I'm walking down the street like, Hey, what's up guys? Like, how you doing? And my friend's like, dude, you can't say hi to those people. Like, be careful around here this is like a rough neighborhood i was like hey guys how you doing hey I, I, i'm andy and people are looking at me like who's this white guy over here you know it's like my an wife, all black neighborhood when when my wife came to visit uh to canada we were just walking through like the trails where we live and i was saying hi to everyone and she's like do you know those people i'm like no it's just, what, it's just yeah, what it's friendly. i mean that's people doing new zealand so I, i'm back to the very open like lovely you know i loved that i mean la was a, it's a very big culture shock for me but also I just grew in lots of different like arts and culture and music and all that stuff just like exploded out of me when I moved to Los Angeles coming from Minnesota, uh, which was great for me. And it just, um, you know, made me like crave, like expanding my, my world even larger. I mean, my life is just about exploration and going to places I've never been and, and, and like soaking all that in and how can I evolve as a person from what I learned from all these other cultures. And um, so, and so like this creativity, this creativity that you have, uh, that you took from Minnesota and brought to LA, um, like what kind of films were you working on in school? Was there like, how, how what were the sets like, what were the cameras like, how long was the productions? Like kind of give me an idea of like how it influenced your filmmaking, um, differently from when you were doing stuff in Minnesota. Well, everything was moving over into digital where like in terms of like digital and you just, um, you know, are recording stuff onto hard drives and, and chips and memory cards and stuff. It was just like so much easier than working with tapes. And you got to like, oh, I think maybe like when I first got there, we were just getting rid of tapes, but you like put a tape in, you know, and you're like recording on the tape and you got to like try to cut stuff out. And like, you, like you I, know, I remember they showed the us film a film reel in my college, just like just once and then it was done. <laughs> that was that. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, and so as soon as we got into the digital, it was just like, oh, let's just like shoot a bunch of stuff. We'll shoot this. We'll shoot this. Oh, we can just get rid of that and blah, blah, blah. Um, so it was really cool. And we got to use, uh, we started the, uh, the school I went to, the art school. Was, it was kind of pricey in terms of like what you were getting. But we had lots of like really good gear. And you could go to the film locker and rent out tripods and lights and flags and cameras. And um, I'm trying to think of what the first cameras we were using. I mean, they were still pretty like bulky kind of like shoulder cameras Probably but they some were Sony's or something like that, I imagine. yeah yeah and um uh it was good we were we did all kinds of different stuff we had like a directing class we had a, a three camera setup like film uh, or tv studio class because we had two studios in our school that we could build sets on i mean my first film that i did uh was called fate and we built this like you know basically two wall uh set kind of like matrix meets uh seven meets saw it was very like greeny, like grainy about what a selection uh, of films about a, to play off of. Yeah, it was like it was because it was those it was those three films that were like that was my motivation for that because uh, it was just like a five minute short film about an assassin who's like in wakes up in a hotel room because he's been drugged and there's a, a a bomb in the room somewhere and he has to like find it within five minutes otherwise like it explodes 
and there's like a guy watching him so he can't leave and there's all this like you know back and forth talk and uh i just it was cool to, like build those sets with your friends like you just stayed there all night building them and you'd like you know bring some energy drinks and stuff and you'd spend 10 to 12 hours in the studio overnight like filming this you'd have like a crew of maybe like eight to ten people the, the actor was there you had like little like little like lunch breaks and had like a little catering thing because you're trying to do it on a small scale like learning how to like do a production um whereas right before i left we were like i did i worked on a pilot episode that me and my buddy or that my buddy wrote and i was just helping him like co-direct it and he was the main star we like flew to philly and shots and stuff then we're back to la like shooting a bunch of stuff around la a crew of probably like 30 maybe like 10 actors um so it was cool to like progress through los angeles really like grew me in terms of like working with people and creating big productions i mean you have to like work with a good 20 to up to you know 100 people or so and i love that kind of environment you're like a team trying to create a goal or a story or you know create some sort of emotion in someone and that's what i love about film how like films can really move you can i so the guy's in the room there's a bomb was the bomb uh his truth all along he had to confess to a crime to well no it wasn't it was kind of like the, the it was called fate and it was basically like whether he finds the bomb or not he's gonna die because he he realizes right at the last second that the, it's in the clock um he's like ripped apart the mattress and he's like tore apart the tv and looked in all the drawers under the bed and like you know and this guy's like talking to him and there's kind of like this character that it cuts off in the background you wouldn't see his face we like made sure it was like his face is always blacked out but like his like conscience be like you're never gonna find it you only got 30 seconds left like and all these like little things and he's like oh and he finds it and then he goes to walk out of the room and he opens the door and the guy shoots him in the head and he gets killed anyways and then like bloods come up from behind his head and he's just like laying on the ground with a bullet hole in his head um I don't even remember. <laughs> like, but you know what? I won best script and I won best film uh, in my class. Every like uh, we used to do like these uh, achievement awards um, for our like classmates and something. We would vote on like what was the best like you know what the best film was out of like the twenty of the, the students that year. So like you seem to have had a lot of like collaborative uh, stuff in your life uh, go on. Do you feel that's a better process for creating art as opposed to like just doing it solo? Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, it's always good to grab ideas from other people. Uh, at least I, I think so. I mean, I don't know, art, I feel like, I mean, there are thousands of like solo artists, but even someone, you know, like I follow directors like Christopher Nolan or Wes Anderson or Martin Scorsese, it's not just them. Like they probably have a hundred people behind them that are doing a bunch of like these things to make the art happen. I mean, yeah, I guess most of the credit will go to them and people like look at their name instead of like the, the second AD or the gaffer of, of that uh, show. But I mean, they're all really part of, I think, that collaboration. I think you wouldn't get people working with guys like Martin Scorsese and Chris Nolan if they didn't feel when they were on that production like they were really part of, of that movie or, or whatever it was they were creating. And so like, how long was it before, after you graduate uh, university or college, whatever it was, post-secondary education, um, that you joined uh, Princess Cruises and did the whole ship thing? Well, I was like, where we I mean, met. Right out of, yeah, exactly. Right out of um, uh, film school, I was just doing like PA stuff. Cause I mean, no matter what you did, even if you went to school for four years and put yourself in, you know, $70,000 of student debt, you still had to start at the bottom. And there were these guys that were like my age that just didn't go to college and just started as PAs. And they were already like working their way up by the time I was coming in. Now I'm like below them, but I have a bunch of debt. So I still had to work on the bottom. And I worked on a lot of like different reality shows and things. Cause that was where, um, the TV industry was kind of going. I was getting tired of like big budget films and stuff that was like the same project. I was rather, I mean, and reality TV was really good money as well. So I was just doing that, but I didn't really feel like doing reality TV. I was like justifying my worth of creating art because all the shows I worked on were like terrible. And I would never even watch them myself. Like let alone, I would never even watch the footage I was shooting for them. Um, which didn't, you know, doesn't make me like passionate about what I'm doing. Um, and it was probably like just a year or so out of college. And then I kind of, I just wasn't making a lot of money. I had all this debt to pay off and I got provided with an opportunity to potentially go work on ships and basically just be a guy that just like makes his own videos with one other person, like a two, a two man team of like just filming cool nature videos and creating little documentaries. I was like, what? That sounds awesome. I don't like get out of here. I don't have to pay rent. Don't have to pay car. I'm like, hell yeah. 
And so like when you when you first joined the ship and like you kind of got your run of the things and like doing like the um the main document like so for me like I like having worked with you and worked on cruise ships like we were able to be very creative together with commercials and like you helped me a lot in terms of like getting my like uh, experience in terms of like shooting the correct way and I always will say thank you to that because like you helped me influence me a lot in those terms um but like like the, you're still limited in terms of what you can shoot on on ships did that a little, yeah. did that bug you at all or like were you um I mean honestly when I first started all cruise ship videos were was just images and videos over music there was nothing there was no in, people weren't interviewing people weren't like trying to create like a story so when I got on there, I was like, well, I want to like make these like stories, you know, like the passengers are getting off the ship, a little time lapse, them getting off the ship. Oh, hey, welcome to Juneau, Alaska. We're going to go whale watching today, blah, blah, blah. Then you go out and it's like beautiful shots, you know, of the, the whales. And then the interview, like, you know, I would do an interview a lot. Uh, me and you were like, that's what we, we were kind of the first ones that really started to push that on Princess Cruises to start doing more interviews and like creating stories because that's what people were more interested in. Of course, they, they'd want to purchase that a lot more than just yeah. a bunch of video footage over music. It was kind of like we were creating these stories. Um, and I didn't feel actually that was limiting at all. I felt like we could kind of do whatever we wanted. And, and that's kind of why we started doing commercials as well. Because I mean, there was no one there to tell us what they thought good video was or wasn't. I mean, our boss technically was the photo vi photo video manager, but he didn't know anything about video. I mean, we were the only ones on the ship. They like to pretend masks. like they do, but they don't. Yeah, yeah. No, they <laughs> totally didn't. I mean, I felt like all the managers I had, because I'm so like, you know, outgoing and kind of like energetic about the videos I'm making, they were just like, yeah, sure. And I, we were always selling like the most videos out of like any ship. At pretty much the three years I was on ships, I was making sure that we were like always doing the best. And yeah, it's weird how like if you if you actually make more. something good, uh, people will actually buy it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I thought like I really thought some of the stuff we made was awesome. I mean, I still have some of the videos and show friends to this day of you know ten years ago stuff that I shot in like Rome or whatever. But it's still a cool little five minute documentary that I'm still really proud of, especially for the time. Um, but yeah, it was great, man. I mean, I, we had, we had so much fun, and I was even a little like my first contract being at Island Princess. I mean, I was with my um senior when i first got on because i was on as a junior uh just for like a month or two and after that they were like oh we don't have any other like seniors to send to the ship and he called princess like dude this guy could just be a senior just like make him a senior and send him a junior and, th and then they send it then they made it promoted me and send me you so after like three months of working on ships and just getting the swing of things me and you all of a sudden we're like running island princess making like the highest we were on the dawn my friend we were on the dawn Oh, the dawn. Okay, so you, the okay, dirty you were dawn. a couple. Oh yeah. Okay, so you were New Zealand then. Yeah. I thought I thought we were, we did the whole Australia New Zealand Fiji run. Remember? Uh, okay, maybe just because me and you were such good friends. I'm trying to think of who my first junior was then. On oh, it must have been okay. It wasn't the Island Princess. Okay. So I wasn't the guy like that replaced. Peak. Was it the guy that replaced me at, on the dawn? I think you guys had didn't done the island together. Oh, me and him were, oh, that was Andrew Wright. He's actually my best friend from film school who actually replaced you, which was like, it was cool getting him on um, the ship. Okay, so we were on New Zealand. So we, I mean, we were still, we're killing it in New yeah. Zealand, like doing awesome tours and stuff. Um, now let's go, let's great, go inside it? baseball. It, the Dirty Dawn, fucking one of the most epic runs you can ever possibly have. Notorious <laughs> in the fleet of Prince Cruises. What... <laughs> Dude, we had some epic fucking stories. In the oh, it was good times, man. It was great times on that. What on is that what ship. is your like favorite memory from that ship that is now uh, RIP? <laughs> oh yeah, is it gone now? Did they sell it? Yeah. Um, I think we were one of the last favorite, contracts before they got they they got rid of it. I favorite think. memory from the dawn. Oh man, um, man, there's so and like you know after I worked on on ships as I started. I worked for head office for like three years and I was going to like multiple different ships all the time. So that's why I probably was confused about what, when we worked on, because it's like the early years of princess were like a blur. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember my first time coming to New Zealand. That's what made me fall in love with New Zealand. So it was when we were together then. Yeah. Um, and that was what made me be like, I got to move here someday in my life. Um, yeah. Hobart. Man, Tasmania. I mean, I oh, love Hobart, the bar. Hobart was in Tasmania. But we would hit Akaroa, Wellington. Um, oh yeah, for sure. 
News, Some of those uh, poker games we had on the dawn were awesome. I Jesus, like, yeah. How much? Great how much? Poker games. All right, maybe you can help me with this. But how much money did we take from that staff gap? Oh my gosh, dude! Must it Mario or yeah. I think it was we, it was Mario like, thousands. because <laughs> I, they were like I beckon, uh, I beckon, I beckon. The, the Italian officers like they will never like back down if you raise them. They will just like constantly call you. So you just like make sure you have like a maid hand and then you just raise them and just bankrupt them. But how crazy. much money did we actually as like a group playing? Like how much did he lose? Do you think? Oh, he must have. He, I don't think he ever won. Maybe like one time. He had, it had to have been thousand, like two or three thousand. Yeah, for sure. Oh my God. Yeah. That good. And I mean, the good. crew parties that we would have, we'd have epic crew parties. I still have one of my favorite photographs is uh, you and me, me and my costume and you got the dick in the box. And I'm reaching in as the Joker. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. That was good, man. There were so many, like, oh, man, there were so many parties. Uh, it's like out of all the different ships. Because, I mean, how many ships did you do? You probably did like six different ships. Uh, I did eight contracts, and I think it was like six, maybe seven different ships. No, I think I. Yeah, had... dude, you might have done more. See, yeah, you didn't do more contracts than me. I think I only did like six contracts before I started yeah. working for that. Well, I, I, I left and then I came back for finance, and that's where I went, met my wife, who's from Santiago. So. Oh, yeah. It was all for the betterment of my life. <laughs> well, I'll be seeing. Well, I'll be seeing you in Chile then someday because I, I, I'm probably going to end up there. Oh, wicked! Yeah, no, we can. Uh, we can. Uh, we hope. Well, who knows when we can start traveling again? But as our our first stop, and then hopefully Japan. Um, now, with your, you like you said, you went and worked with corporate. How different was that transition from shooting all the time to telling people how to shoot and what to shoot? on the corporate end oh dude it was like so i went to corporate and they basically we convinced them to stop hiring out this outside company that they're paying like over a million dollars like to every year to film like little videos and stuff for them like dude we'll do it me andrew and then my buddy scott who was like working at head office um who was our boss uh, we're like we'll do it like way cheaper just give us like two hundred fifty thousand dollars to start and we bought like c300 cameras with like the best like canon prime lens set some like slider, you know, some automatic sliders that you control on your iPad and stuff, all these nice like stabilization devices, quick releases and stuff for all like underwater mounts and all kinds of stuff. And we're like, all right, we'll just go out and like shoot you a bunch of promo videos. And it'll be all just like actual passengers and actual stuff that's happening. We're not going to like stage anything, which like now, because they still do it. They like, you know, they're like bring actors out and it's like super staged. I was on, like, I was, that's dude, one I was reason on. why I left. I was on a ship that like they had a crew there and I was trying to talk to the crew and they're like, just like big leaking me. I'm like, you guys realize that what you make is like, just because you have better camera doesn't mean what you're doing is better. Right. Like, no, for sure. it, it got to be a little bit like, but at the beginning it was awesome because we were literally, it was the first time. So we were used to being on the ship. Like the captains are in charge of us, blah, blah. Now we come to the ship as head office, like, boom, we're head office. We do whatever we want. I remember the first time I came to, uh, who was our photo manager on like Paul, Paul Haynes or, or maybe who was our photo video manager? Not Paul McCulley. No, it, it wasn't was like, Paul. Or maybe it was a uh, Scott Higgins or something. That was, um, we had the, uh, we had anyway, the, so like, we did the buoy shots with the flame in the part in the rooms and everything. Remember? Oh yeah. 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 But yeah, I remember so Higgins was fucking, I Higgins was dope manager. as shit. I love that dude. He was, he was, he was good. He was great. All of my managers. I even love McCulley. And uh, I went on a ship with him and he was just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you're not my boss now. And I was like, yeah, I know. I was like, I'm just, you know, it was great. But you should have tried to boss him like, around just so he could humble him a little bit. Well, we got this free reign to go around the ship and just like do whatever we want. Basically we're going down having drinks with passengers. Like, Oh, can we film some stuff? Like filming the guys doing the cool martini things or whatever. Um, went on whatever tours we wanted, got like a bunch of exclusive stuff with passengers. We would just try to get like all these different age brackets of passengers and who, you know, which ones that were like the highest, like selling kind of like age group and like film like more of them, but then get like the new up look, upcoming, like younger generation. And like, yeah, it was just awesome. We just, I mean, we created um, our first project was called Core Values, which is basically like what they show everybody when they first start working. Oh, Princess. you son of a bitch. Still, That's what I had. Oh, you fuck. Yeah. And they probably still, they probably still show it today. Yeah, it was a probably. Great, that was, was you. A, oh God. <laughs> it was a great little film. It was good. Did I you make, did you make the, did you make the safety video with the liars light, the old people? Yeah. Li you made that? Yeah. You, yeah. Fuck you, Andy. You son of a bitch. Wait, wait, wait. You know how which painful one? Which, that video was? No, wait, which one? The one, not the muster station one. Oh, it might've yeah. been. 
Yeah, the mustard. We're, we're like good. Well, the old lady's know, like lies. They're lying to us. Lies. Oh uh, no, I don't think that was us. Okay, no, thank I God. I was gonna get really mad at you for a second. <laughs> no, we filmed we filmed this environment. So we filmed the one called Health Wise, which was basically almost, which is funny. It's about like making sure you get your flu vaccines and like blah 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 before you work on ships because we work in these like you know little like communities and we all have to like keep safe and blah blah blah. Uh, we also did this environmental series, like a six-part video on how like awesome Princess Cruise is, is to the environment and stuff. And then like a year or so later, they get hit with that like trillion dollar fine for like dumping stuff in the middle of the ocean. And I was like, oh my God, we spent like months making this environmental <laughs> series to try to like show how like awesome Princess is <laughs> at keeping up with oh man it was funny it's, um it's ridiculous we, we made, it's, it's ship life is one of those things that no one unless you've actually experienced it no one truly will ever understand the stories that you have to tell from those those events and everything for sure and while we were filming these um you know while we were filming these things on ships and even off land i mean we went and filmed like a six-part documentary series that took us the whole month or the whole uh season of alaska we went like two weeks each month of the season because like, as you know, from Alaska, like it's different every month, you know, when the, when the uh, salmon start running and the bears come out towards the end of the season, the beginnings, like the whales and the eagles and blah, blah, blah. So we went like two weeks, like each month, like May, June, July, August, September or whatever. Um, and made like probably like the greatest project I've ever worked on in my life. Got to just like be out. like. In Which the one was it? Was that Heart of Alaska? It wasn't Heart of Alaska. It was called, um, I think they ended up breaking it up into like a, like a six part series. We wanted to call it, a, I was like, you know what we should do? Well, we film it into the six parts, but we make one hour and a half documentary and we were going to call it Ashigania, which means like pe people's connection to nature. It's like an Alaskan Sounds a lot like, better phrase. than what they probably produced eventually. Yeah, for sure. No, I was like, we should shop this around at, um, I was trying to get us like pitch it to you know, Netflix and other, and like try to get awards and stuff for it and get it into festivals. But Princess had us just put it into six part videos. It's like one part is about mushing, one part's about like the sand. Oh, that was uh, one the, part's um, about, one part's about it, like glaciers. I think it was like the, the uh, I want to say it was a gold rush sort of fucking video. There wasn't one, it wasn't gold rush, wasn't in there. It was, um, oh, was this, one, was was the, this one, the one that was available? Well, Scott for did that one, wide, or? Scott did the gold. Well, Scott did the gold rush one while we were still working together on the dawn. I think that one came out, and Heart of Alaska was already out, which Scott did, did as well. My boss was like, he's the one that did Heart of Alaska, yeah, and the gold rush one. And I don't know whatever happened with those because I stopped working for Princess like kind of right after we did this documentary, um, thing. So I don't know, like if it, if they like release it in small little videos separately on the ship, or I think it, they, I think because they, I, I, so I, what I think happened is they just released it on their video on demand service. <laughs> it wasn't even a DVD they, or anything. They might have, because my copy of it. What does my copy say? It just says Alaska feature rough cut. So I don't know what the actual what they were like calling it. Um. But I know that, yeah, I mean, it was awesome though. Uh, like we met some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life and it kind of like changed my whole concept of, of like, ah, maybe do I, do I want to be in this like film game thing, just living in LA doing this or do I want to get back to nature and stuff? And that's when I just kind of like dropped out of doing film stuff and I moved up to Alaska to go live in Alaska for the summer and just be like a nature guide and enjoy living up there. So... Um, it's, it's interesting to me because you have this weird dichotomy where like you grew up in Minnesota, which is a very nature valley sort of thing. And then you chose a career that involves a lot of technology. And then you do this documentary that involves te technology that makes you want to get back to land. And now you're in New Zealand where you're very much yeah. like working with like the, the earth and everything with your chefing and everything. For sure. Oh, How... I do a lot of farming in New Zealand as well. I love farming. I mean, so like... What was it about Alaska that made you kind of like, what was the, the, uh, the light bulb moment for you that you're like, this isn't the life for me right well, now? Well, I mean, after my season in Alaska, I realized, I, I remember thinking back, like in LA, so the year before I left, I made like a hundred grand and my plan, my goal of life was always to like, oh, make a bunch of money and have a bunch of things and be famous and blah, blah, blah. And I went to Alaska and lived there and made nothing. I think my yearly income for that next year, the year I lived in Alaska and just travel around Canada and stuff and spent like three or four months traveling around Canada, I made like $35,000. And I was infinitely happier with like so many more memories and 
outdoor experiences and photos and like beach fires and like impacting other people's lives, you know, bringing them on the zip line or taking them out for a canoe or, you know, walking with them on these like tracks, did like multiple different multi-day treks and just hikes all the time. And it was awesome. And lived like just this like super minimalist, you know, low impact lifestyle that I like really grew into. I mean, at the time I was getting very like into like reducing my waste and making all, all my products from scratch, like soaps and hair things and toothpaste and like just trying to like get rid of most of my possessions and see what little I could live with and just enjoy myself more than pursue all these like intrinsical like technology kind of things. I still like love technology and still try to utilize it um, in ways that I can, but like try to keep my, but also try to stay connected with the land because that's where I feel the most energy and the most like revitalization um, when I'm out doing things outside. And part of your connection with the land is also, you know, being part connected with the interactions of the people that you, uh, that you interact with while you're doing everything that you've done. Um, what is, what is it, why, what is it about that? Like, you're very outgoing, you're very, very friendly, much like myself. Why, why do you feel the need to interact with so many people like I do? Um, I just think you can learn so much from the more people you meet. Like, I've learned something from everybody I meet. So, um, and I love learning and I love growing and there's, I always feel like there's more people out there that I can connect with that can be like me or that can push me to become more of the person that I want to be. Like I'm trying to, I try to kind of find these people that are living off the land that garden all the time and, you know, do all these, or builders, like build their own tiny houses and things like that. So I can try to like learn from them because those are things that I still like have on my goal list to do for myself. Um, so, I mean, the more outgoing I am, the more opportunities I'm going to have to meet these people and to learn more things. If I just live a very sheltered life where I try to like find everything on the internet and just like learn everything for myself, I feel like I just, I think people need each other, which is why like in terms of today with all the, you know, vaccination mandates and all this like weird separation of people. It's just, it's, it's a shame because we're herd animals and we kind of need each other. And the, the way for like humanity to keep expanding is to like connect with each other and try to learn from each other and not it's, hate each it, other and get it, so it's, angry with each it's other. It's fascinating you say that because like in a world where we're more connected than ever, we're also more divided than ever because we're more connected. For sure. But we're connected through well, something that's not real like the internet as opposed to being connected through face-to-face -face touch um talking conversation that sort of thing because like i feel like with anyone that i have a con like a conversation with is like i'm not I, if, if it starts to escalate i'm like all right this is not an argument this is a discussion we don't need to raise our voices at this time <laughs> for sure and i mean i even get i get heated as well because i mean there's, I just, everybody's got to have their own opinion these days that's kind of what it has become the dividing factors is that like everybody gets to be heard so and everybody kind of wants to be unique in a way so they got to have a different opinion you know, it seems like half the time and no one wants to like fully agree with anybody else it's like oh well i kind of agree but there's a little thing that i don't agree with or i don't know um you know we can't no one can agree on anything so it just seems like it's like it's constant like butting heads and i think that's the um I think that's the sad part because I feel like the people who are biting the heads most time are people that, you know, don't have the experience that you or I or my wife or whoever we know that have had the experience of traveling and meeting people from other cultures, other sexes, trans, non-binary, different religions. And like, you realize that you, it doesn't matter. Like you can still have fun and, and, and have a conversation with those people. Even if you don't speak perfect English or they don't speak perfect English or sort of thing, like, there are ways to communicate and have sure. fun that don't involve, you know, um, talking about politics or, or the vaccine or whatever the fuck it is. For sure. For sure. I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot nicer when you just talk about each other's lives. Like, you just stay away from politics and just like, I want to learn about your life. You don't need to like press upon your like issues uh, or not your issues, but like your, just tell me about you and like what you, what you believe and what you enjoy. Um, and but so, yeah, like, you're very outgoing as well. <laughs> yeah, I get. I'd, I've I've always been the the weird guy that's always been like very out there, front and center sort of thing. Um, now you you you're kind of gotten all away from the video thing because you mentioned before we started podcast that 
you know, you're in New Zealand and New Zealanders want those jobs to so become a chef. Like same sort of creative aspect of being a chef compared to being a video producer as well or different? Um, no, I mean, yeah, I don't know if there's too many similarities. Um, well, I mean, in, I, in, I the, sense, in the sense of like creating yeah. something new. Yeah, no, I love, I love food now. I mean, I've definitely have a higher aspect, a higher respect for um, creating my own meals and stuff. I mean, just earlier today, I was making some pesto and I make my own like mayos and things like that. And we, I'm, we only, me and my uh, partner pretty much only uh, buy vegetarian slash like vegan stuff. I mean, we'll eat, we'll eat meat. We're not, I wouldn't say like we're not meat eaters, but it'll just be like special occasions or might get some fish from the neighbor and make it ceviche or something. Um, but I love creating. I love just like adding spices. I've always kind of been when I'm cooking, just throw stuff in and just like smell it and taste it and see how it is. And that's kind of what chefing is. So it kind of came natural um, to me to be a chef. And um, I like being creative in the kitchen. I'll kind of look at a recipe, but not like follow it, you know, strictly. I'll be like, oh, yeah, a little bit of this. Okay, that's in there. Okay, I'll throw some of that and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I love that. Uh, and I, I think once I'm not chefing, I'll be creating so much more like awesome food at home. But since I'm doing it all the time for work, it's like a little bit more of a struggle for me to do it at home sometimes because I'm just like, well, I do this all, all day. Like, I don't want to come home and do the same thing. So how so how did you how did you get off ships? Um, well, we talked a little bit about that. It was just getting tedious. But how do you tell me your path to get to New Zealand after ships? Because, I mean, you said you said you went to Alaska, went to be of nature again, and then you fell in love with New Zealand when we were on the ship together on the Dawn. And I fell in love with New Zealand. Yeah. It's truly one of the most magical places in the goddamn world. And I wish more people it's, had a chance to experience it's, 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 not just the people, but like the environment of that country. It is beautiful. Honestly, New Ze- uh, so, I mean, when we first were in New Zealand, I basically, I had, I, and I still told people this for years. I was like, I'm moving to New Zealand someday. And people always like, laugh. my friends in LA were like, shut up, man. We're going to like make films together and we're going to you know do awesome stuff you can't move to new zealand that's that's ridiculous like no but trust me like i gotta move there it's the most amazing place and we get a free visa until we're 30 and like to go there and just like work and live for free and do whatever you want and um yeah i was getting close to 30 and i was like you know i had all these big opportunities at princess and i was making a bunch of money and we were doing all kinds of awesome projects and it was me and my best friends and it's like shit a dream come true i'm working with my my film, my two best film friends from school that I got working with us. And then Scott, who became like a good friend of ours, we were having a great time doing whatever we want, partying, like filming our own projects or basically creating our own thing. Uh, we have like our own offices and our own like production studio. And I'm kind of like, let's just like, you know, let's like leave princess and be like, now that you now the, now we're good. So now you can hire us out as an independent company and we'll still do stuff for other people, which is what they're doing now. But this is like, you know, what I was saying at the very beginning. Uh, but Princess kept like offering us more money and stuff to stay there. And I was kind of just like, ah, you know what? I'm getting like sick of being in the offices all the time because it started to be like, oh, we're filming a bunch of their seminars. And now I'm just, like sitting in front of an editing screen doing Ugh. a bunch of like tedious edits of like Ugh. their financial reports and stuff. Gross. So I was like, I was like, nah, I was like, after that Alaska documentary, like, I feel like I need to get out of here. So I move up to Alaska, still with New Zealand in mind. Like, I'm going to move to New Zealand someday. I'm going to move to New Zealand someday. I was like, let's just go do a season in Alaska. I had the idea while I was filming, um, like, so it was on the dawn. So you were with uh, Char- uh, Crystal and Marlon. Do you remember Crystal was a dancer? Marlon um, was a drummer in one of the bands and they're married now. He's from St. Lucia. I went and filmed their wedding and stayed in St. Lucia for a week. Um, and at the time I was with Brianne and I was like, you know what? Like, let's move to Alaska. And she's like, you think so? And I was like, yeah, I bet you I can get a job easy. We, I used to go up there all the time. I know all the tour companies. Yeah, I had a job like this. So we move up there and we we're talking about the whole time. I was like, okay, why don't we, you know, after Alaska, let's do like three or four months, you know, uh, tour through Canada. And then I'll be turning 30 in December. So let's, I want to move to New Zealand. Let's move to New Zealand before I turn 30, like the week before I turn 30 and uh, get my visa and we can spend a year in New Zealand and see how it goes. I was like, to be honest, I probably want to get residency there because I was getting a bit over like all the debt, all the student debt that I had. And it just seemed like it was going nowhere. No matter how much I worked, it wasn't paying it off. I kind of wanted just a fresh start to move to New Zealand. Um, so after Alaska, we did like this big road trip. I spent maybe a month or less in California and then bam, like got rid of most of my stuff and just went to New Zealand and for the whole year how do you how do you do that though i mean seriously like it's 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 such an uh asinine so not asinine sorry 
some people would think, oh my God, Andy, you're fucking insane. What is wrong with you? Why can't you I just, mean, why can't you just move back to Minnesota where mom and pa are, we cook you a humble pie, blah, blah, blah. But you're just like, no, fuck it. Let's go. In. Why, why can't more people be like you? <laughs> I don't, well, I mean, they can be. The thing is you just have to do it. It's not, it's not like I feel like I did anything special. It was, if anything, I thought after I was doing it, that it was like so easy. And then when I get here and I'm just like meeting these people and having these experiences, I'm just like, yeah, I'm totally doing the right thing. And this is exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And I've ridden so many of these waves of being like, this is exactly what I should be doing. I'm in the perfect place. Like even now with the, uh, with my beautiful, lovely girlfriend, Valentina and chickpea, the little dog you saw earlier living in a tiny house on a big farm. I feel like I'm like in paradise. This is exactly where I was meant to be kind of right now. And I'm just like riding this wave and like getting rid of my stuff was easy. It was awesome. It felt so good to just get rid of, you know, all the couches and the TVs and all the shit that I had in LA and just like sell it to friends and get rid of my car and blah, 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 and do this. And then just be like, all right, I'm going to go to New Zealand with like 10 grand. We'll see what I can do. And I get there and I like within a couple of weeks, I was, I did a, I like worked on a little film thing. Um, it was just like a, like a cancer, like a colon cancer, like conference or something. <laughs> so cancer. Um, but like this awesome. Um, and I did a couple things my first year film wise. I filmed like two or three weddings, which is always good money. Um, I did a couple promo videos for some different like upcoming brands. Um, and I was doing some cool like independent stuff. And I, I would definitely love to get back to that one day. But until I'm resident of this country, I had to be on a work visa. And yeah, I just kind of started at the bottom with the chefing thing. And I've kind of upgraded myself to like a high level chef that I can um, apply for residency come March. So I just got to keep like riding it out until I get residency. But like the day I get residency in New Zealand, I'll probably put in the resignation. <laughs> but I mean, like, it seems like you have like, well, you just best... got to do it. You just got to do it. And it seems like you're doing it. And it seems like you've had all these stories. So like, what does the future hold for you in terms of being a creative person? Cause you're very social, very creative. Uh, you're a chef now you're a video producer. Could you not just become the Guy Fieri of New Zealand and just do both? I feel like there's a lot of things. If I was a resident, I could do a lot of different videos. I mean, Val, my uh, partner, is a yogi, and she does lots of, like, online videos, or she did, a, like, a series of online videos during lockdown, and me and her should definitely, like, film some more online videos for her um, to get people to subscribe to because she has, like, hundreds of people who love um, doing her classes and stuff. And I would love to like make more videos of just like the how we live and just to like kind of inspire people to, you know, just do the things they want and be happy. And, you know, just before we had our talk, I went for a little bike ride down up to this like lookout, mountains all around, gorgeous like morning ride with the dog, give the dog a nice like walk. I'm going to go play some frisbee golf later. I'm going to go see French Dispatch tonight. Wes Anderson's new movie that I was telling you, you got to go check out. It's going to be good. I, you know, I tried finding a trailer for it. There is nothing there. So I'm very intrigued about it. I'm very intrigued. No, what? You'll definitely, you'll definitely find a trailer. You type it up on IM. Don't you ever go to IMDb? IMDb is like. Uh, you just go on YouTube and it's not there. I, I, I just, but like, I, this is actually like, well, it's cool. No, I'm trying to do less trailers and more watch okay. it first time. The trailer is good. The French Dispatch, that, for sure. It's a good trailer. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like Wes Anderson. Anderson. Like You're not going to go wrong with Wes Anderson. You, no, you can't. I mean, honestly, like. You go to a Wes Anderson movie to see his style of filmmaking and just seeing the colors and how quirky they are and the frames and everything and the characters. Like, I'm, I know I'm going to enjoy it. I know I, I'm just like, I'm so giddy. I've been waiting for a year because it was supposed to come out like last year. And then with all the COVID stuff and they push it back and blah, blah. blah and I'm just like, I want to see this movie because there's not that many good movies that come out these days. Uh, and, Mark and, and I opinion. go see I'm a, Mark I'm a and huge I... critic. Mocking, well, you, I, you're a huge creator, but I'm more of like a, I love everything sort of thing. So I always kind of give reviews where there, it's always positives. Cause I mean, for sure, you and I both sure. know how hard it is to even get a movie made. So <laughs> I'm always no, a little definitely. more lenient with how, when things are made. like in particular, the best movies over the past few years have been the Joker, uh, the Joaquin Phoenix one, Knives Out was fantastic. Yeah. The newest Knives Dune, is, the newest Dune is fantastic. Um, it was good. I liked it. I like the new Dune. The I hate it that they like break it up though. I mean, like Hollywood is constantly stretching things out yeah. or retelling the same story over and over again, which like really frustrates me. So if I go to a movie and it has like the same formula 
you know, like let's say like Fast and the Furious or something. Like you go to those movies, it's going to be literally the exact same thing every time. I haven't, uh, I don't, I think the last time I watched the Fast and Furious, it wasn't even Fast and Furious. It was uh, the Hobbs and Shaw. Hobbs uh, and Shaw, which is, you know, whatever. But it's The Rock. And I can't not support my boy, The Rock. It's the fucking Rock. (laughs) It's crazy, man. I, I watched so him funny. back in 1996, I think it was. I mean, he, he's, it's the, he's the man. I have to. <laughs> Good old Dwayne Johnson. Good old um, Dwayne Johnson. But the, uh, the the new James Bond movie was fantastic, too. I thought that was a really beautiful yeah, see, end to the story. Really? See, I wasn't, I wasn't super stoked about it. Because I feel like they, they've taken James Bond's character to this, like, new, you know, Daniel Craig level of, like, I'm going to, like, kick your ass and I got you know 10 vehicles against me and my crazy like car and before like I, I didn't see up, that at all I love James Bond I love James Bond yeah there was a scene where he's like doing a car chase and he like you know he like outruns like this this like car or whatever and he drives over the hill and then all of a sudden like six like SUVs come over the hill to like chase him down okay and I'm just yeah. like when did James Bond become like bad boys and like all this other stuff, you know, he used to be like this. Since technology has evolved, kind of Andy, slide. since technology has evolved. <laughs> I know, but I mean, even Casino Royale, it's like so much more simple and a better story. Yeah. And I think like not as like well-known characters. And um, I mean, I just felt, felt like some of the stuff was so forced in yeah. in that movie. Like I liked it because else. I thought it was a nice end for the Daniel Craig version of James Bond. Era, yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought it was, I, mean, I thought it was really good. I think it could have been shorter. Obviously, I think every movie should be around an hour and 45 minutes, ideally. For sure, <laughs> um, for sure. But I don't, it, it's fun to talk films with people that actually know, like, film. Because, like, I have people that are just like, like, why are you so kind to movies? Why do you, it's like, well, because, I mean, unless it's absolutely terrible, like, and it's like a big budget movie, kind of like, um, the one that comes to mind as like a terrible movie that should never is uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The end, like, like. Oh well, I mean that's like one of the worst movies of all time. It's yeah, gotta it's, be. But like that's one of those rare cases where there's no redeeming qualities because you know everyone got paid on that set. Everyone, it doesn't matter. They did such a poor execution of that ridiculous. That movie is ridiculous. Some of the the scenes in that movie are like like the ant scene or the scene where he's like swinging on vines and stuff. It's like so stupid. But that is what I feel like a lot of movies have become these days. I mean, stretching The Hobbit into three movies, whereas like I used to read that book as a kid and having Lord of the Rings be so amazing, and then taking The Hobbit and adding a bunch of stuff to it to then stretch it out into three different movies where it probably could have just been a really good two and a half hour, you know, epic movie. Yeah. Because that's the, the book is short and it's awesome, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like they're just doing that more and more like these days. And it's just like really. Well, I will, I will say about that, like, yes, we're getting lots of remakes and retold stories, but like, like that's now. And that's only been over the past 10 years. Like give it another 10 years and everything will go back to like more creative films. Like uh, what's the one I want to watch? Uh, the new, I hope so. The new Ridley Scott film. I really want to watch the uh, last duel. The last duel. Yeah. I hear that's great. But you know what? That's not actually like, the, you don't know Ridley Scott's like original film. So he has the original film called The Duelist, which is about a bunch of like duels that were happening. And it was like Harvey Keitel, like amazing film. And that's kind of what actually got him started. And so The Last Duel is kind of like him. It's like taking one of those duels from The Duelist. I don't know if there was, it was actually one of the duels in The Duelist, but then like just making that a bigger story and like what that, why that duel like had happened or whatever, um, which I started watching it. And I mean, I love, so it's I have like a love hate with Ridley Scott. Over the last ten years, it's been like horrible movie. Oh, not too bad. Horrible movie. <laughs> well, average so, movie. So average let me ask movie. you this, though, right? So like I um, we all know that there are great filmmakers out there, but they're great filmmakers because they're given their 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 ideas are let to breathe and do everything. But they have people give them notes. I feel that like certain directors nowadays have, who have too much power. Like, it's not the same. Like, a James Cameron, Spielberg, Tarantino, like, yeah. I feel like like they need someone who's of that same power that would be like, hey, no, maybe do this shorter or this. Well, for sure. But, like, it yeah. seems like... Everybody's just like, whatever you want, whatever you want. Like, I'm not going to watch The Irishman because it's three hours and it's fucking special effects bullshit. Like, you could have had... You could have hired younger actors to play the young characters and then, like, it, it, was, it was stupid. <laughs> and that movie is super long. But you know what? It's not a bad movie. 
but it's definitely not. I wouldn't even put I'm it in sure Scorsese's like top ten. I'm sure it's a great like, fucking movie. 10. It's three hours, man. I don't have that fucking. It's more than three. It's like it's like it's like three and a half, I think, or something. It's no, like even ridiculous. even worse. <laughs> I don't. Care. Yeah. Homie, it don't might play even be that, longer okay? than three and a half. Does not it play even, that. It might even be longer than three and a half. Um, oh goodness! But I remember direct- when Departed came out, and people thought Departed, and that's what that was like Scorsese's movie that won a bunch of awards. But I totally don't. I, I would put Departed like bottom ten, maybe. Really? I put like that's casino. Like one of my... I put wow, okay. Really, I put Casino, Goodfellas, Gangs in New York above that. Um, there's even other like score. I would even put oh well, it's a different kind of movie, but like Hugo or have you ever seen Kundin? Kundin, amazing film about the Dalai Lama, um, about the Dalai Lama's life. Martin Scorsese did super like artsy, totally like. Is that a documentary I mean, or is that an actual? Is this no, no, it's a film. Yeah, it's a film. Okay. Um, really good film as well. And there's some other, what's some other Scorsese that I like? I mean, Departed is good, but it's just it's just like a kill set. Like everybody just kills each other. So game back to like you and your creativity, but both as a chef, as a farmer, as very. What do you find influences your creativity the most? Um, nature, I guess. Uh, I mean, I've been like one thing that we don't talk about or we haven't talked about that I do a lot of is I play a lot of disc golf, um, which not a lot, of, not a lot of people know what that is. No, we were, we were going to get into it. Don't worry. <laughs> it's slightly big in Canada, um, uh, but a lot of my creativity comes from playing that. It's just my way to kind of unwind since like the sports that I used to play in the U S not a lot of people play here, like baseball, for instance, like no one plays here, but I played that since I was five. And that's like probably my like most played sport. Um, and I just heard whispers the other week about like a softball league or something being played in Nelson. And I was like, Oh, what's that? I got my glove here. Like <laughs> I bet you I can step onto the field. And they'd be like, where'd this guy come from? Have you, have you been um, able to try Have you ever been able to try and transition your love of baseball into cricket? Um, I had like one time I went and played cricket with my buddies and they were like, I was like, okay, what's the goal? And they're like, okay, you just try to hit the ball where people aren't and you don't want them to like get it. So I was like, okay. So then they started pitching me and I'm like, bam, 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 hitting it like all over the field, like all around all our guys over their heads. And they're like, I was up there for like 20, 30 minutes. I was like, how long do I do this? They're like, well, you have to do it until we get you out. But I didn't think you were going to be this good at it. And I was like, oh, I played baseball my whole life. Like, I know how to like directionally like hit hey, man, ball, like, maybe that's what, that's what, maybe that's how you get permanent residencies. Like, hey guys. Let me try out for the national cricket team. If I oh, get, they were if, like, <laughs> if I'm good enough, no give me my visa and I'll play. I'll play for you guys nationally. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they're like, I mean, I doubt the other aspect of cricket. Like, I mean, I, I don't know the transition, but um, yeah, it was funny. They were like, man, you should, you should like go fucking play with some cricket like teams. But I find when I watch cricket, I'm not that into it. You know, it's kind of like I never really watched baseball that much. I liked playing it, but I wasn't a fan of like watching it, and I just didn't really care that much about learning the um all the rules and stuff plus i was just started trying to get back more into disc golf because disc golf was such a small thing here when i first moved here that i was like oh like i started seeing like the skill level of some of the players i was like oh man maybe if i put in a little bit more time on this i could be like one of the best players in the country um which is like one of my goals over the last like couple of years was to try to like elevate my game to like beat the best players in the country yeah no it's so i'm not going to knock any sport because it does take some skill and everything uh, to do disc golf but so like you mentioned how like that's your creative zone because you kind of get to unwind and let that creative creativity flow through you and I imagine that some of the shots that you have to make over distance have to be pretty fucking creative to actually hit the net yeah for sure well and the other creative aspect I, I left my bag here so the other creative aspect I do with my discs are like so this is my Thor hammer no nice. very like overstable disc you are worthy a, uh, <laughs> yeah I have a, a Ninja Turtles, a Ninja Turtles disc. I have a a special disc that my buddy, like uh, a artist, did for me. Oh, dope! I told him. I told looks him, like a swastika, but it's okay. Well, no, get this. I told him nature vagina, <laughs> so you can kind of see <laughs> this little. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. that's my little. You know. I also see a swastika that. in there. It's weird. weird. <laughs> Batman. I got, nice. ba- I got Batman. I got Iron Man. My Iron Man heart piece. You fucking nerd. And my 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 matching War Machine heart piece. Okay, nice. I got, dude, How many I got all the do you have? Know. Hulk smash. <laughs> Hulk smash. Yeah, these are all. You know, this is what I love about disco. I like my creativity. Like all from my childhood and stuff. I get my buddies to do these little dies for me. Like 
these are my buddies that did these that, that did these things for me um and i love that and i like you know not a lot of people have like custom dies on their disc it's becoming more popular but um yeah so I, I what's, it been, what's it been like for you to see the growth of that sport in that in new zealand it's awesome man i mean since i've been here we've probably i've myself like helped build like two or three different courses um in the five years i've been here there's probably been at least like 15 courses built uh and more, a lot more people are getting into it like the first year i played on the new zealand disc golf tour there was maybe like 150 people the very next year there was maybe 250 300 now we got like close to like 500 people. I mean, not all of them play tons of different events, but they'll play like one event a year or like there's now there's like uh, one day events happening all around the country. People are just, you know, 40, 50 guys. And we're selling out tournaments at 150 people per tournament, like every once a month or like twice a month sometimes. And I imagine that like with that, with helping it grow and with helping get the sports ground, you are able to not only help something that's a very fun and interactive sport but you're interacting with so many different people and it's not just like oh you have to be 20 to do it you can do it of any age it's throwing oh yeah for sure we got lots oh we got lots of women too this is like this this is old woman her name's jenny joint she's like in her 70s and she's played over a hundred tournaments in new zealand and she we call it a battle axe i mean she just comes i mean yeah she's not she's not she's throwing at 50 60 meters at most but she's just having a great time she just loves coming out the course that she plays, her home course is like a really tough course, one of the toughest courses in New Zealand that she just goes and plays like, you know, a couple times a week or whatever. And it's awesome. And there's, there's lots of different age groups. We've got young kids, young juniors. There's a guy that just won the tour this year, 17 years old or 16 years old, because um, he scored like the highest uh, in, you know, it's like your six best scores basically out of the season. Um, but yeah, it's great, man. And there's a, it seems like there's like, constant movement of the players like last year i finished sixth in the country on tour points and this year i was probably like in the 30s or something because i missed out on my last two tournaments because they were supposed to be up in the auckland area and they were locked down and i wasn't able to play in them and they had to move them to next year which yeah who knows if i'll be able to go now but um it was a little disappointing i had a couple of really good finishes i won my first tournament this year um in the town that i'm actually the course i'm gonna go play today um it's a golf course uh disc golf course which is becoming a little bit more popular which is cool because it's kind of like, you know, disc golf and regular and ball golf are virtually the same thing. The scoring is exactly the same. Um, and it's cool to kind of utilize those beautiful golf groomed areas. And we use all like the, the areas off to the side in the trees because that's what we want. We want to try to shape our disc through trees and things like that. So you can play the same time as ball golfers. And it's kind of like a little interactive thing. You just got to like watch out for each other. Um, but it's cool and it's growing and you a can lot. drink and, and you can smoke some weed while you're playing i'm sure it's fucking totally like totally exactly it's awesome i mean and it's like perfectly groomed because a instead lot of, of a golf cart you have an e-bike that case takes you from <laughs> well some of the courses we play are like in like crazy nature areas where if you screw up your shot and it like drifts over to the right or something you're like in some crazy you know far away land down a cliff side throw it off the edge of a cliff I, like I'm wondering, like, do you think this is a sport that could be filmed? Because I feel like it'd be awesome for, oh. like, for the New Zealand Dude, accent to have commentary over top of it. It's like, all right, so what, what, <laughs> you know, like, uh, we have uh, we have we have Flexline Media. Flexline Media for the last like two years has been filming a bunch of tournaments around New Zealand. I'm actually on one of them. I'm uh, I've only done one filmed round. Um, it was at nationals this last the year previous. Um, but Flexline Media, great. Uh, and there's like tons of film companies in the U.S jomez is like huge they have like millions and millions of subscribers that watch them and that they film all the lead cards of all the pro tour events you got gatekeeper media gk pro central coast uh ace run productions like there's tons of uh there's so much disc golf footage now it's becoming huge it's actually um i think at the committee for uh the olympics for next summer so disc golf might be in the olympics next summer and there's so like you could, world be, you, could be an, you could be an olympic athlete maybe I would love to like that play, to your story. <laughs> I would love to play to, for New Zealand in the Olympics. There's there's a world um, like team uh, event that happens every two years, and a couple friends of mine from Wanaka played it. And there's like a it's like a ten man team from each country. And the first year they did it, New Zealand got like fourth or sec or something. And then the, uh, and then two years later they got like I think second. And then two years ago, which it should be like coming up the next world, I think they got like six or something like that. Um, but I would even love to play on New Zealand's like world like team because it's like maybe you get drafted a team maybe you get drafted a team USA and they 
It's like, hey, if you come back, we'll clear all your debt, man. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I'm a like probably a top ten player, maybe top twenty player uh, in New Zealand. In the U.S., I'd probably be like hundreds down. I mean, the skill level in the U.S. for disc golf is like so much higher than here. Those guys. Oh, you are, think so, eh? Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's because the the courses and the things and the the competition they're playing against is so much higher. Like, I've been trying to like really try to increase like the difficulty of courses and stuff. Um, is one thing I'm really trying to push here because we have all these like super easy kind of putter mid-range courses that are like 60 to 80 meters, you know, a couple hundred feet, which is like, you know, doesn't really test your skill that much to throw a really high speed driver, 140 meters. Like I can throw shots that are 120, 140 meters, you know, like 400 feet or whatever. And potentially like further, if I had holes that actually required me to do that, but I don't. So some of that, those shots, I can't. I don't even have in my game because I haven't played courses like that. But you watch in the U.S., they play courses like that, and that's the competition level of those guys. Like they would smash all of us for sure. Like they they have like a rating system in the PDGA because the PDGA is the Professional Disc Golf Association, um, and it's big, hundreds of thousands of members and stuff. And like my rating is like nine fifty four or something or nine fifty six. And like Paul McBeth, who's like the greatest player in disc golf, is probably like ten fifty four. Yeah, and but he's like on PEDs, so I mean, come on, all Americans are. No, man, these guys are like all, and they're my age. <laughs> they're all like younger than me. Paul McBeth, I think, is my, maybe like two years younger than me. Ricky Wysocki is like two or three years younger than me, two of the best players in the world. And they like, like incredible, like their control of like the discs and stuff and like the putts that they make. And it's like insane watching these guys play. It's awesome. I love watching it. I mean, just because it helps. I mean, I think it, it increases your skill, like watching the best people play as well. It's like watching the only the- way to play better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like you, the only way to get better is to lose. I mean, you grew up a sports fan in North America. I, like, no one, no team starts off great. They have to lose and learn to overcome those, those. Sure. Uh, well, you got to play against the best. I mean, I was just watching, I watched the Kevin Garnett documentary just, just earlier today um, because he was my favorite player in basketball. And that's who I like model my game after. And yeah, it was always, he was always like trying to, you know, like, oh, like, you know, play against the best person. Like, I got to beat the best person. Like, you know, or, you know, that's how you get, that's how you become great is by playing the best people and like learning to like elevate yourself to their skill level. Well, speaking of great, this interview has been great. This podcast has been fucking awesome to reconnect with you. Uh, what do you have, like, with all the stuff that you're doing in your life and have done in your life and stuff that you're going to do in your life? I mean, do you have any goals or are you just kind of living life as it's going or as, as, are you taking it as it comes? Well, I mean, I'm trying to take it as it comes, but I mean, when I first moved to New Zealand, my goal was to get residency here because I would love to be able to say that if I ever wanted to someday come retire here, have a property or build a little tiny house here somewhere and have like this, because I feel like if I were to choose a place that I wanted to be my home in the world, it would be New Zealand. Out of all the countries I've been to, it's just, it's one of the safest and easiest places to live. It's got like every landscape you can possibly think of. Friendliest around too. The world. My God. Like oh, everyone's super so friendly. friendly. I mean, and all the different landscapes are like an hour away. Like you're on the coast, beautiful tropical coastline. You drive like an hour to the east. All of a sudden, like you're in the Rocky Mountains with like huge mountain peaks you can climb. You drive a little bit further. You're in like uh, the marshy kind of grassland, Banks Peninsula, Akaroa with dolphins. And you know what I mean? Like and everything's so close together and you can, there's so much to explore here. There's so many little hidden gems everywhere. Um, it has, you know, all the best stuff. Um one thing is it's lacking like lots of animals i mean there's pretty much only the native animals here are birds which you know are lovely and beautiful and i love all the native birds here and colorful um you know but sometimes you miss like seeing a caribou or a moose or a bear like big giant awesome animals hey man we um, all watched that simpsons episode you can't bring in a you can't bring in a, <laughs> you can't bring a weird animal into the country it was just it was, um but i mean my goals are just to my goals is to get residency here and once that happens i mean now being with Valentina, I have like goals of, of us creating a life together. And she has a property in Patagonia in Chile, which where I've been um, and spent a lot of time and, and love it down there. She has a is property. Is she from Chile? Lake. Yeah, she's from Chile. Oh, nice. um, she's from Santiago as well. Uh, but oh, she so has uh, well, her, yeah. place is, her place is in uh, Chile Chico, which How's is your... like this small little lake town. Um, you know, it's really hard to get there even. Uh, but she, she's like, okay, we're going to go there. You're going to start a movie theater and it'll be a yoga studio on top. And we'll start like a bulk food business and we'll also run tours 
because like you're great at out there. I was like, Jesus, you know, we'll build a tiny house with multiple different cabins that people can rent out on our property and we'll have like all these fruit trees and we'll have all this stuff. And <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, she has a, she drew this like little like drawing of like uh, when we were in lockdown of uh, a little property that we might have with like her little yurt doing yoga. I'm doing like a disc <laughs> off the, off the deck in the trees. And <laughs> how's your, how's your Spanish? It's not the greatest. Me I, neither, yeah. <laughs> My goal for the I, new I really, year is to like, learn more Spanish so I can actually have a conversation sure. with her father and her brother and stuff like that. Well, the thing is, you don't actually, you don't truly know who your wife is or who my partner is until I speak Spanish because that's like their personality. We know their English persona, you know what I mean? But like they have a whole different vocabulary, I'm sure, when they speak Spanish. And, you know, they're like little uh, like ticks and things that they do a lot that we would do just because it's natural for our own language they you know learned that language and it's not as you know not as natural so i mean i i try and i definitely could put forth more of an effort i need to like dedicate a couple hours a week yeah same um, or just have i need to like actually go to a teacher and have like a teacher teach me because i have like i bought a couple of like apps and things um to try to help me but i just like i mindlessly go through them and i get them all right and stuff but it's nothing sticky nothing's like yeah. really like cementing in my brain yeah, so the one thing that we try to do was have like uh, every Sunday was Spanish day in the household. But then I, I quickly was like, I have no idea what you're saying. Can we go back to Spanish? <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. I told this, I said the same thing to Valentina. I was like, just like, just speak Spanish to me and just like force me to have to learn. Otherwise, I won't know what you're saying. You know, like that's like really the only way for me to learn too. And that's why if I move to Chile, I'll eventually, I'll definitely learn living in Chile. Because I well, mean, here, I'll tell you this. So like we do plan on having a Chilean wedding we'll invite you to the wedding that way she can come home yeah. and we can, we can see i can actually see you and and uh, i have one gringo to talk to at least <laughs> well we're potentially going to try to go to chile next year we'll see like around we're hoping July. to go we're, we're trying to go in april Oof. okay yeah. omicron yeah man omicron. travel is <laughs> oh my god travel is i know i have a wedding that i need to go to in mexico with, like my two greatest friends and we're like let's go to chile after that but i don't even know if i can go to the wedding too i'm just like i'm still like Ooh, i don't know but. fucking ridiculous man it's so great to see you we will have to do this again shortly and not just like ch- talk randomly and stuff like that. this is awesome yeah, man it's been great chatting with you we didn't get to talk too much about films i love talking about films there's not too many people here that how, about, about, how about how about uh how about in january we do like a, a film preview for next year you know yeah, break sure. down all the films when they do like that yeah, yeah, or like the Oscar nominations coming up because that's usually oh, when, Oscars like, are Oscar bullshit. Stuff. Let's have some fun and talk about our favorite well, films. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, we all know true, it's a rigged system, know. anyways. Yeah, it's true. You were, you were in LA, you know. Yeah, it. man. It, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, well, yeah, man. It was great talking to you too, man. All right, cheers, brother, Andy. Oh, Andy, before we leave, um, do you have any social medias that you like to post or prove or anything you wanted to promote, uh, New Zealand wise? You no, know, like I the, don't. I don't post too much. I mean, I post stuff on my Facebook. I mean, my Instagram handle is ACK Artist. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I just kind of do stuff on Facebook and just it's more for family and friends. Uh, I used to want to like start a business. That's why I had ACK Artist. Um, but I haven't really done much stuff with it in years. So, um, but yeah, you can shout that out. But other than but that, yeah, just. I think the main thing is like if, they, if you're listening to this podcast, go try Frisbee Golf. You'll have a good time. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Really awesome bomb. <laughs> All yeah, right. So. Cheers, brother. You have a good one, eh? Later, dude. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Andy. He's a really great guy. Um, he's super talented, obviously, because of the video work and the chef work and the physical. Like, the tools in this guy's belt are unlimited, and there's uh, more to come, I'm sure, with his, what he plans on doing with his life. Um, Keep tuned to the uh, podcast forum. We have, I uh, over this course of this Chris- Christmas break, I took a, uh, I banked a lot of uh, podcasts. We're going to keep them coming uh, every week, every Monday, I think will be the release date uh, for these podcasts because uh, I know some, not a lot of people release them on Monday and I want you guys to start the week off right with a, a fun chat, if you will. Uh, so stu- stay tuned for next Monday where we have another fantastic guest. Um, As for me, thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see you guys down the line. Cheers.